Good morning. Good morning. Come on. From you on the East Coast, it's like almost noon. Your body time. You can. Good morning. All right, I'm going to start my clock here because they didn't put a clock in the room, and so I will start blathering on and then won't have the foggiest idea what time it is, and it will be lunch before we're finished. My name is Bob Tandy, uh, and in my role at the University of Iowa, I'm actually in charge of all of our capital commissioning. So that doesn't sound like a lot, except for we currently have uh, just a shade over $1.2 billion worth of construction going on on our campus. Uh, got a little over $4.2 million worth of commissioning under contract right now. And so I get exposed to a lot of you okay, in a lot of different ways in a lot of design firms. And what I'm hoping to do today is actually leverage that to give you insight into how we institutions think. Um, well, I got some feedback when I was toying around with ideas on what to, what to talk about. And one of the questions that kept popping up was, how do you guys make decisions? You know, why, why, did, why did you decide A versus B? And so hopefully today we're gonna get through some of that, give you a glimpse into kind of behind the curtain as to how we do base our decisions, uh, what things influence us as institutions. And then at the end, I wanna give a little bit of insight into where I see us going as an industry and how hopefully how you guys can differentiate yourself from, from the competition. So here's how we're gonna get there. First, we have to do some AIA stuff. That's mandatory, so you all get credit uh, from our, our beloved masters at the American uh, Institute of Architects. Then, we're gonna go through what really shapes us, what makes us different uh, as far as institutional clients and, and what really you need to know about that, about how we think. And then finally, hopefully give you some value. AIA. AIA, AIA, actual content. Any questions? <laughs> so, so what, makes, what makes an institution different? First of all, defining institutions. I work for a Big Ten college. We are actually the smallest of the Big Ten schools, or at least were until Rutgers and Maryland came to make the Big Ten something like 37 schools. Uh, as the smallest school, we actually have one of the tighter campuses. This is a map of our main campus. We are a city, and like a lot of institutions, we view ourselves as a city. We have responsibility for traffic, we have responsibility for public safety, for fire response. We have a campus utility plant. We co-gen, make our own steam, make our own chilled water, have utility distribution, we have tunnels. Um, some of which are over 100 years old that we're currently limping along. We have, give or take, 30,000 transients that all move in on the same weekend. They all move out on the same weekend. We have about 70,000 people that show up every, uh, every other Saturday in the fall. We have tens of thousands of employees that come on and off our campus. What that means for you as, or for us, as far as commissioning goes, is our commissioning doesn't stop at the walls. For us, commissioning doesn't end at the property line. Our decisions are made based on how all of those subsystems within the building tie into our bigger systems and our campus distribution system, and how the access control on a given building has to tie into our master access control. So some of you might be aware that uh, it makes the news when there's a live shooter on a college campus. We have to be able to manage that. We have to be able to manage everything from uh, protests to, we live in Iowa, so every four years we become very popular on the national political scene, and so we get all kinds of very high profile visitors come through. We have to be able to manage all of that on campus level and still be able to respond to cold calls for our individual receptionists or occupants or users, or in some case, Nobel laureates who are very, very proud of themselves and their work. So they demand a lot of attention. From a commissioning standpoint, what that means is we have a lot of different details than say a developer that we have to worry about. Developer plugs into the street, 
make sure their building works for five years, flip it and go home. We, we don't have that option. So we're small cities, and we, we, we tend to think like small cities. We also have the uh, lovely distinction of being massive corporate cultures. So this is the layout of University of Kansas. Every box you see there is effectively a company. It's either a department or a college or a specific unit for a specific job. Behind each one of those boxes is a whole another bureaucracy of boxes. Below that bureaucracy of boxes is likely another bureaucracy. We have several bureaucracies that are stacked four, five, six deep. What that means is, from a commissioning standpoint, you can have a lot of masters when you walk in, or a lot of people at least you think they're the master. A lot of competing budgets, a lot of competing interests, a lot of competing instructions. So who do you listen to? Figuring out just who actually makes the rules, and more importantly, who doesn't make the rules, can be a brutal undertaking. The, I would, the joke we use is, we're like an onion. We have a lot of layers, and eventually we will make you cry. So getting, getting past all of this, all of this messiness, and trying to figure out who is actually setting up your owner's project requirements, and who is enforcing those requirements, and who can answer a question, sometimes a simple question like, what's the set point supposed to be? You know, what do we want to return water temperature when it dumps into our, our campus loop? Just finding that out can be, can be a daunting task. We don't intentionally make it complicated, but we don't intentionally make it uncomplicated as well. I mentioned a little bit earlier, we have president, pre, presidential wannabes that are starting to, to litter our, our state. We are political bodies. Specifically, uh, in the United States, there are about 550 state schools and state school systems. We are anything but political. Check that. We're anything but apolitical. Uh, at the University of Iowa, our president has retired or is stepping down in the fall. That means that everybody is trying to jockey their position. By everybody, I mean our Board of Regents, which is our governing, governing body, which is appointed by our governor. The governor himself has started to take an interest in who the candidates are. We have legislature. They're taking interest. We have the local politics are involved. It is a mess. And so you think it's hard to hire somebody who's qualified to do commissioning in the field? Try getting them through that gauntlet just to run a university. We actually have people who will call us and meddle in specific hiring and firing uh, disciplinary actions, people from a state house. And our, our leadership, the, the layers of the onion above me, they make their decisions based on politics. Uh, we have a civil firm that works a lot on our campus, and they do an excellent job for us. Such an excellent job that we want to hire them for most of our work, and cannot. Why? Because somebody else will get a phone call if we give too much work to the person who does a very good job for us. Not saying that the other person can't do a very good job, but they don't have 40 years of history on our campus and literally know where the pipes and bodies are buried. So, Sometimes, we would love to give a lot of work to a certain company, but we've given too much work to them lately, and so we can't. And that sometimes is a hard pill to swallow, specifically if you're a company that works very hard to ingratiate yourself with a client, only to find out that you're not gonna get the next big job because you got the last big job. Does anybody here know what that building is? Anybody here from Virginia? William and Mary, that is the Wren Building. The Wren Building started construction in 1695. It was completed just five short years later in 1700. Today, right now as a matter of fact, there are people who are sitting in offices in the Wren Building. There are students at William and Mary who are going to classes in the Wren Building. Our time threshold is off the scale. We don't build five-year buildings. We don't build 20-year buildings. We, a building's not even getting broken in for us in 
until it's 50 or 100 years old. Now this is the extreme case. You know, they, the East Coast, they had a little bit of a head start on everybody else. Um, our buildings, uh, our Capitol building, which is the, the premier building, our, it's our marquee building on campus, it's 150 years old. We're constantly remodeling it, upgrading it. I don't know if you know this, but over 150 years, a lot of technologies have changed. <laughs> yeah. Um, trying to put, uh, we're currently on a project trying to put audiovisual in the state house without letting anybody see any wires or cameras or microphones or speakers. Uh, we look at a building not as, as a developer looks at it or as a company looks at it where it is a, say, a 30-year investment. For us, it's a lifetime investment. And, and really, the architecture shapes how we think. And so that really, really influences the, the way we look at our campus. Look at a, a campus like Harvard. Harvard has a very specific palette that they use. They have a very specific set of construction um, materials. So that makes their commissioning of their envelope very uh, challenging at times because the designers have only a few pieces and parts that they can put together in different shapes and still make it work. And so, you know, there's the old tried and true, keep building up layers until we shed water. Uh, turns out shedding water isn't the primary problem right now. It's keeping the coal out and the, and the warm in or vice versa. The way we look at our campuses is very emotional. Um, right now, as I said, in 2008, the University of Iowa had a major flood event, a uh, transformative. We, uh, bit of trivia for you, this probably won't make any of you any money at a bar, but until Sandy, the University of Iowa was the single largest FEMA payout in history. We have four complete buildings that were destroyed. Um, we have literally it transformed our campus, this flood event. So coming out of that, we are, we are transforming the way our campus looks. We have, I call them celebrity architects. Are there any architects here? Excellent. I will talk about them. <laughs> I grew up an electrician. Then I went to work for 15 years for an MEP consulting firm. And I have tried, and I do not understand celebrity architects. <laughs> uh, we have uh, a Frank Geary building on our campus. We have Kelly Clark Pelly is building a building on our campus. And they use, uh, they use their influence and their celebrity to make decisions on buildings that we have to live with for, hopefully, forever. That can pose challenges to the engineering side of things. Our new art building is using chilled slabs. So effectively, the intermediate slabs in the building are piped and going to be used for the climate control. From a, an MEP standpoint, that scares the living daylights out of me. I'm going to lose, potentially lose control of a building that's full of art. And I don't know if you guys know this, but some people get really emotionally attached to art. And they get financially attached to art. Um, so we, we have to look at our buildings completely different than, say, again, a developer, uh, the five years you flip, or the, I don't care about energy. What I want is a residential style uh, HVAC unit, residential style furnace in each one of these spaces because I'm going to sell them off. Uh, a lot of our systems are not, are not built that way. Another interesting thing, so we've been using heat recovery wheels uh, and trying to capture a lot of energy there. We know they're horribly complicated. The control sequences are complicated. We have a hard time making them work well in our buildings because of, in our climate, in the middle of Iowa, our design day in the winter is 20 below at 5% relative humidity. Our design day in the summer is 90-90. So we have a lot of conditions that we have to deal with. So we're putting them in knowing that they don't save us any energy, but because we want the real estate. We want to claim that real estate because the technology will eventually catch up. And if we don't build that section of ductwork or that section of mechanical space, with that space, with that room, we lose that opportunity forever. 
So that is a totally different mentality than a lot of, uh, I keep coming back, are there any developers in the room? Maybe I should quit hacking on them. <laughs> that, then the developer mentality where they look at it from that very short perspective. So this is an uncomfortable, this is gonna be an uncomfortable slide uh, for me. As I was researching for this, this talk and looking at what we, uh, really what differentiates and trying to discover what differentiates commissioning agents specifically, but design firms in a lot of ways as well, it becomes hard. A lot of the selection is based on personality. Personality of the design team, personality of the owner's team, and relationships. So I went through, and we, on average, when we put out calls for a commissioning project, we get somewhere between nine and 15 respondents to those calls. I went through and highlighted what the quals package from these, in this case, 12 individual firms, what they said was their distinguishing feature, what was their unique selling proposition. Turns out all of them said dedication and experience. Turns out all of them said, you know, our, our people are our difference. And while that is correct, it makes it very noisy from a selection standpoint. You know, this, this honestly, this is what you all are trying to rise above. This is the noise on the playing field right now. We at, uh, at a lot of institutions, I teach at APA. Are any of you familiar with APA? It is a facilities group for higher education, primarily. And I teach commissioning at the APA group. And we talk about this a lot. How do you know who's a good commissioning agent? So you all have great, I'll tell you this, you all have great marketing departments. They're great photos. Turns out every one of you has tons of experience in whatever kind of project <laughs> we put on the street. Um, finding, finding those, those unique selling points, I think is, is a challenge for any business operator, specifically for an industry like this where it's not understood by lay people. You know, you know what commissioning is to most people? That last 20% of a project where you're trying to get everything started? You know, a lot of our, even our institutions as we educate them, they say, yeah, we, we hire a commissioning agent about 50% construction, you know, through construction so they can come in and start things up. Like, fantastic. I bet you get some fantastic quality <laughs> out of that as they're trying to cobble together a system that wasn't designed well that you didn't tell them what you wanted, so you got what they thought you wanted from the design team. That completely ignores what in my mind is the real money maker from an institutional standpoint, which is the operations phase of that building. Getting out of this noise, coming out of, from, a, from below, really what's the shadow of uh, the popularity of commissioning as a buzzword and distinguishing yourself that is the real trick here. And, and really, that's, that's the meat and potatoes of what I'm trying to get, the conversation I'm trying to start here. Because I don't have the answers. If I did, I would be actually on that side of the table making huge money. All right, so how do you do that? How do you make yourself a partner with your client. Well, the first thing you have to do is peel the onion without crying and find out who the decision makers are. That, I'm not telling anybody anything there. Finding the people who are actually gonna make the decisions, the he's and she's who are gonna sit in that room and actually make the decision, that's the hard part. The even harder part is finding out what they really want and making sure those are the right people to be making those decisions. When I came on board at the university two years ago, uh, we selected commissioning agents primarily with just the construction, uh, planning, design, and construction side of the house. Operations and maintenance didn't have a say. Our utilities and energy management side had a little bit of a say, but for the most part, it was a planning, design, and construction decision. That, that was, we rectified that very early on to say, listen, the cost of construction is a pittance 
compared to the operations cost. Remember that, that 300 year old building? What do you think it's cost to build that versus what it costs to operate it for, say, the 295 years since it's, it's been open? Operations is where we, that's where our costs are. Uh, ironically, it's funny, my, we'll get press because we, we're building a Taj Mahal, you know, $100 million, $130 million research lab. And I laugh, I'm like, yeah, we're crying about $130 million and I'm gonna spend seven or $8 million a year in just energy costs on that research lab. You know, 10 years from now, that $130 million is gonna be nothing compared to just the wages of the maintenance staff that we have to hire to keep that thing operating for those, for those uh, let's say, celebrity researchers that, that some of us have on campus. Educating your clients and being educated by them, I think that is, that is, that's the sweet spot, the magic spot. And what I mean by that is, first of all, you, you can help me as I talk to institutions to understand that commissioning is not a construction activity. It's not a design activity. Done well, it's an operations and maintenance activity. All we're doing is setting the stage. You know, what, when we build a building, we're just setting the stage for the next, hopefully, 100, 150, 200 years worth of operations putting people in a position where we can operate it efficiently and effectively and replace those 30 year parts that we know we're gonna have to replace. Um, 30 years sounds like a long time until you're in the Wren building. 30 years is a blink of an eye. They probably have furniture that's older than the state of Iowa. <laughs> Educating them about what can happen with construction, or excuse me, with commissioning and the advantages to really all, all the parties. The owner's advantages are obvious. They get a better building. Um, we help take the complication out of a very complicated set of systems and the interactions between the systems. That's what commissioning really does for the owner's standpoint. But even the design team and the construction team, um, you all as commissioning agents have a much better insight into how the systems fit together than the design team that drew them on the paper. Because just like construction is very siloed as far as trades, engineering is very siloed. You will have one designer who does, on a major building, may do all of the, say, hydronic piping. They don't look at all they, at the, the other piping systems, the, the plumbing piping. They don't, they don't look at all hardly at the ductwork, except where there's a conflict and they want to run a pipe to a piece of ductwork. The electricians, the electrical designer, you know, they get a list from the MEP, from the mechanical people, saying this is the voltage and this is the amperage. Give me a connection here. Oh, and we'll provide the VFD. No, you provide the VFD. No, nobody will provide the VFD. <laughs> you know, so, yeah. But believe me, from an owner standpoint, those hurt so badly. <laughs> that, that, or when both provide the VFD, which means that they can say that we thought the other person had it and I still end up paying for it. How does, how does that work? If nobody writes it on their paper, I buy it, I have to pay for it. If the mechanical and the electrical put it on their paper, I still have to buy it because then they say, no, the electrician was supposed to provide it. No, the mechanical was supposed to provide it. So getting, you all have a glimpse of the systems that is completely different than anybody else on the project because your job is to work in those edges where, where the RO system has to feed, say, the humidifier, which has to feed the air handling unit, which is downstream connected to the VABs, which are interlocked by some sort of control system to the, the exhaust hoods. We've just walked through 10 different trades trying to get to that point. You see the big picture, and where you can be huge, a huge uh, influence and advantage for an owner is to be able to put that on paper. We have a my poster child for sequencing, not scheduling, sequencing, which is looking at systems and putting systems in the order that they need to start up to be efficient and effective. My poster child is our Papa John Biomedical Discovery Building, $140 million uh, research building. Um, very cool side note, the entire, uh, I think it's third floor and part of the fourth floor are dedicated solely to curing diabetes. So we have researchers coming from all over the world. We're trying to make a diabetes cure. So 
This building, we're doing startup, and we're trying to start up the Phoenix valves. Phoenix valves in the, lab, in the uh, lab spaces, and we start messing with them, and then the hoods came online, and now the air handler's not down. I'm like, why is the air handler down? Well, we can't finish the air handler commissioning, so we can't finish the, the Phoenix valve commissioning. Why can't we finish the air handler commissioning? Oh, because the humidifier doesn't run. Like, why doesn't the humidifier run? Well, because the RO system doesn't work. I'm like, why doesn't the RO system work? Well, the compressor, we need a line, half inch copper line run from the compressor to the, the RO system. I mean, so we have tens of thousands of dollars worth of people standing here doing part of our job because of 50 feet of half inch copper pipe. You know, um, that's almost exactly verbatim the question that I had to answer <laughs> to my management team. And I, I think you guys can solve those problems. You can't tell the contractors like who has to go first and and you get in those he said, she said, and I'm almost done, and what's almost done, and I can't get started until you're started. But really, if you step back and draw, the air compressor has to be done and connected to the RO system. And the RO system has to be completely done, started, and commissioned before we can really even look at the humidifier. And before that, that has to be done before we can really do the air handling unit. And we might as well not even start on the BAVs until the air handling unit's done. The plumber, looked at that half inch water line, or excuse me, half inch pneumatic line, and it was like a no big deal. It's a day's worth of work. That's fill-in work for our apprentice. It was a keystone for us starting our Phoenix system. We had all these technicians standing around while we're trying to run a temporary pneumatic line to get enough air to run some of our other systems. You have a unique position in the project in that you can see that stuff. And you can put it in a graphical form that allows the contractors to understand it. And that's the biggest thing. Understanding from the project's standpoint and educating your client about that potential value that you have, and then understanding from them, really, what, the, uh, uh, what inputs they need to have at what time to make that happen. How many people have been standing around waiting for the owner to tell them what set point to put in a given piece of equipment? Anybody? Am I the only one that's had that experience? You know, everybody raise your hands. Let's be honest. <laughs> um, that onion I was talking about, that bureaucracy, we have a hard time getting out of our own way. As an owner, we have a hard time getting out of our own way because we don't, we don't want to step on toes or that's somebody else's job or somebody else's department. Uh, you all are in a position where you can say, here's the line in the sand. This decision has to be made by this point. No, you can't, you can't wait to select your controls system until late in the project. You can't. You can't wait to select your lighting control system. You know, BAS controls, we, we've pretty much got that figured out. We've been doing that for years. With the, the different code requirements for lighting and what you have to control and have to sweep and have to turn off and where you can and where you can't and daylighting. And I don't know if any of you have started looking at 90.115, but the daylighting, it's gonna take a rocket surgeon to figure out how to do daylighting with the different zones. It's, it's, it's incredibly complicated. You all are in a position to know when those decisions really need to be made, and from an owner's standpoint, can say, you know, you become critical path. Mr. and Mrs. Owner, you're a critical path after this date, because you need to make a selection on whether you're going with the Lutron system or the, the system A, system B, system C. The other thing you do is really hammer, 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 please help me look at total cost of ownership from the owner's standpoint and not construction cost. The, the, we're seeing our, our costs for commissioning on capital projects are ranging in the, on factoring out some of our kind of anomalies or outliers. We're at a percent, percent and a half sometimes, sometimes uh, on the larger projects. Uh, down to half a percent or six tenths of the construction budget is commissioning. We're, we're seeing similar numbers across the country, you know, they ebb and flow kind of regionally. That is nothing compared, again, to that total cost of ownership. It's, it's an outlier. The Wren building is an outlier, but it's a beautiful outlier in that it's 300 years old. You know, so five, six, seven, eight, nine generations of maintenance staff. Okay. 
the looking at that cost and getting our owners as as an industry to see that the commissioning cost is nothing compared to operations, and so why aren't we tailoring the commissioning to operation instead of tailoring it to construction? The early on, my when I came onto the university again, uh, my position was brand new. I got to create it myself, so I I really got to create the position in my own my own style. And my boss, I love her because she gave me tons of freedom to make lots of mistakes as long as I didn't make all-in mistakes. One of the things I did is I sat down with our operations and maintenance people and I said, what do you need coming out of a project? You know, on substantial completion day, we give you a ring of keys and say, here, go ahead and run this for the next 100 years or so. What do you need? And we started talking about O&M manuals. Now, having come from the design firm, for me, O&M manuals, that was easy. You put in the approved shop drawings, you put in uh, whatever maintenance happened to show up with the machine. When it showed up, you know, the maintenance and uh, operations, put that in a three ring binder, put a transmittal on the top of it, mail it in. From an operator standpoint, they don't care. They don't need a bunch of generic information about all five potential models that exist for the train, fill in the blank, modular air handling unit. Unimportant, at two o'clock in the morning when the alarm's going off and the on-call person gets that is not what they want to see. You know what they want to see? What should be in our good systems manual. You know where our system manuals were going? In a box that eventually made it to a filing cabinet, that eventually made it to a truck, that eventually made it to a huge warehouse that we have um, rented on the outskirts of Iowa City. The systems manual never saw the light of day. We, we scrapped it other than lead projects, which require that we put together a systems manual, so we put together just enough system manual to, to get the lead point. Our system manual um, is squished together with our operations and maintenance manuals. And we radically changed our specifications to say exactly what the operators wanted and in what order they wanted information in our O&Ms. We take our commissioning agents, we want the latest greatest as installed sequence of operations. That's critical for our operations guys. We want the, the startup sheets. On the day it was actually working, what was it doing? We want that in the o and manuals. Why? Because again, at two o'clock in the morning, when the on-call person that's never been in that space or maybe been in there once or twice in their career, when they walk in and there's lights flashing, what was it doing when it worked and what's it doing now is a giant leap forward to making sure that it's running at eight o'clock when those researchers start flowing in, or those students start flowing in, or God forbid, the Board of Regents, which has this you know, monthly meeting in our house every once in a while, God forbid that the air conditioning's not working when they come rolling in in August. You know, they, are, they are our funding source. They are our political, they are our political masters. And so we, we cannot afford to have something goofy going on. So getting, getting our owners to see how much value can happen as we reach operations and maintenance phase, that is, that is unbelievably huge. Uh, that's the value that I'm preaching literally every, every uh, spring and every fall we have our APA conference, and I speak to a room about half this size full of different administrations and uh, different institutions. And I'm like, we're missing the boat, people. We're missing the boat in a huge way. We're leaving tons of money on the table worrying about getting check boxes filled out on our construction checklists, you know, um, arguing over who, who fills out box A or box B. It doesn't matter. At the end of the day, you know what's really valuable? The functional performance test and having that accurate. It doesn't even have to be pretty. It can have coffee stains on it. It can have smudge marks on it, you know. Sometimes I think our maintenance people would would feel more uh, at home if it did have, you know, some sort of coffee stain on it because they know that somebody actually did it instead of just drove by, filled out the paperwork, and then typed it up pretty and sent it in in a big huge binder. So, understanding that total cost of ownership mentality and preaching it to not just our institutional clients as far as education or higher ed, hospitals, large manufacturing uh, units that are looking 10, 20, 30, 40 years out. So this is one, just so you know, so you don't think uh, I'm standing up here telling 
you all that we had this done perfectly. I am struggling mightily with the third bullet point up there. How do I shape our commissioning deliverables so they drop into our systems? So like any good um, public institution, we have lots and lots and lots of systems and subsystems that don't talk to each other. Um, again, more onions. And this one makes me cry because it is such a brutal thing to say, we have all this information available, it sits in database A, and we can't get it over to where we need it because database B doesn't talk to database A. So how do you set up your deliverable? Um, how many times do you touch a piece of equipment? Let's say an air handling unit. How many opportunities do you have to write down basically every piece of information and data on that piece of equipment? Let's say minimum four, five times? A complicated piece of equipment, you may put up a mailbox next to it and, and live there for a week or two. So what we were doing was as soon as, as, soon as the projects were turned over, substantial completion would hit, we would send one of our maintenance people around to all those major assets, and Mike is his name. Mike Allen would go there and spend a week, two weeks, three weeks, depending on the size of the building, going to each asset, writing down the serial number, writing down the manufacturer, writing down the, all the nameplate data, writing down the size of the belt that's on it right now, um, putting a, a barcode sticker so our maintenance people know which piece of equipment it is, how many, how many people have been there before Mike? So what added value would you have to an owner if you said, here's the deal. Here's your equipment list. It's in a, an Excel format. Excel with, uh, I can't do it, but we have people who know how to make the little black magic boxes on, on programming that will dump an Excel spreadsheet into just about anything. We use AIM, that is our CMMS, our, our maintenance management system. Um, we use Icon and a bunch of other systems and Pi and all of these other computer programs that I don't understand what they actually do. We need that information inputted in there. What if your deliverable was literally a, a thumb drive with all of the equipment information already done? And what if for the extra, you know, two thousandths of a percent of your fee, you put a sticker on it? that had a barcode on it. You know, what if you work early with the owner to get the naming conventions right? You know how many potential air handling unit HU1s we have on our campus? <laughs> um, one of my really good friends is, uh, he's an engineer and he's a graduate of Iowa State. Iowa and Iowa State, uh, it's a classic in-state rivalry. They have engineering, as I say, they have mechanical electrical engineering. Uh, we have aerospace. So they can do math, we put people on the moon. You know, but he was designing one of our buildings, in fact, the building that I sit in, and was during the DD phase, equipment's moving around, so there's temporary names put on pieces of equipment to move. And he actually uh, named our air handling unit ISU number one. Uh, that was the, the internal supply unit, number one. That's how he joked it. So for months, every time we unrolled the review drawings, it said ISU number one right on the University Services Building for the University of Iowa. It is now not called ISU number one, just, just so you guys know. But getting those naming conventions, we rename every piece of equipment. You know, why aren't we doing that during at DD? And putting that naming convention, so when you as a maintenance person, unroll a set of drawings 15 years from now, turns out that the name that's on that piece of equipment is the same as the name that's on that piece of equipment. That's a bridge that we can do. As commissioning, we can make that bridge because we're there anyway. We already have to look at it during DD. We already have to review the pieces of equipment. We can set up this table early on. Um, we're trying to figure out how to require the the engineering to output that table as part of their deliverables package. You know, they give us the selected equipment so they can start that table. You as a commissioning agent can fill that table out, that Excel spreadsheet, give it to us as on a thumb drive. We have, our, we have people up in dark rooms up in the top of our building that we just throw information under the door and they tap keys and then stuff comes out the other side. We feed it to them. 
and all of a sudden, Mike is free. Mike Allen, the maintenance guy who's going to go put all those stickers on, he's free to actually do maintenance work. O&Ms, as I said before, completely rethinking our O&Ms, completely getting away from what an engineer or an architect thinks that we should have to operate our building and actually going and talking to the people who actually operate it, talking to our work control center, the people who have to respond, they're our frontline responders. That's our call room, effectively, for uh, any maintenance issues that we have on campus. Having them say, what, what would, what's important? You know, like, our warranties suck. That's a technical term. Uh, it's a, I'll explain it. But they're like, our warranties suck. We can't find them. I'm like, why? why? It's pretty straightforward. Well, they're all filed by spec section. You know what? Uh, I was going to say 15952 uh, to show how <laughs> out of date I am. <laughs> yeah. yeah, exactly. Do uh, you know what? You know, 15 or 22005.0.1.5.b.c means to anybody? Nothing. So what we did was change the naming convention we used to file our, our warranties. And now it says, God forbid, air handling unit XYZ123. Um, looking, looking at how those simple nuances about how you deliver your product at the end can provide added value. That is, that I see as the, that's the holy grail of our industry. And honestly, how would you like to be that firm that everybody's like, why would we use anybody else? You know, these guys make my job easier. When O&M starts putting pressure on planning, design, and construction to use a firm because they deliver the product, uh, we're going to listen. Until, yeah, until we, until we can't hire you because you did such a great job, exactly. Um, yeah, we'll, we have ways. <laughs> so this is the one I'm struggling with. Um, the two, two primary things that I'm struggling right, right now uh, with the way we do things and honestly the industry-wide is how do we make these deliverables drop in? How do we make commissioning more about operations and maintenance and less about just getting the construction done right and getting it operating? And then the second big thing is that noise that I was talking about earlier. Where what are the unique selling points that we want as a commissioning um, uh, consumer? What are we looking for? In, in, instead of saying it's about personality or it's about relationships. So I do have one closing comment, um, a, kind of a combination comment, but I wanted to open it up for questions. We're about we're about 45 minutes in, so we have about 15 minutes left, and I would love to have questions. Yes, sir. How do you see the value of the commissioning services you're getting during that period? Is it where it is improving? Um, so it's improving dramatically. The, the cost of commissioning, it's interesting. We have almost completely gone away, and I, I push the other institutions to go away from selection based on price. Uh, we put out calls, and as I've explained tons of times uh, to different providers, so I look at price the price range that comes in, not as far as who's low, but that tells me how tight my scope is. When I write an RFP or an RFQ, I put, the, put it out. When the numbers come back, if there's a huge range in price, I know my, my scope's messy, because that people price risk differently. If I have a nice tight grouping of, of proposal fees, I know that my scope is good, and that we, you know, there's, there's not a lot of risk in there. Um, so, we took a lot of the fluctuations and variations out of our costs just by tightening up our scope and putting together what, what we wanted really systematically. Um, instead of saying provide commissioning per lead, which, uh, yeah, we have a lot of people who think lead is commissioning and commissioning is lead. Uh, we, we say specifically during each phase of the, of the design, construction, and occupancy, what we expect as far as deliverables and as far as uh, 
activities. So, so I would say our value has increased exponentially over where it was four or five years ago when we didn't know what we wanted. Um, the value of commissioning itself, I think first of all, it's not going away. Uh, and it's, it's increasing. It's as a requirement, code requirement, it's increasing. So really, the costs are going to go up because the scopes are getting larger, because our systems are getting more complicated. You know, 20 years ago, what was lighting control? Was, you know, if there was a lot of light streaming through the windows, what did you do? Nothing, you left the lights on, you didn't care. Energy didn't cost anything. Now, I don't know if you know this, but energy costs have gone up a little bit. Um, just like we were talking, I was talking to a gentleman from Southern California last night. Water. Uh, you might not know this on the East Coast, but I, I guess the West Coast is having a dry spell. Uh, you know, there's no water. How, how do we, that's where the value is. That, that cost, the cost to commission a gray water system or a recovery system or a whatever system to re get that recirculated water, that's gonna drive up the cost of commissioning. But the value that that provides is, is far outweighed by what those direct costs are. Um, so we don't, I, I prefer to approach it from a value proposition standpoint and preach the value proposition and the total cost of ownership over the, the bottom line cost. Now, we've got some projects that are 15% of budget is commissioning. Why? Because it's a, we're replacing all the VAVs in a building. It's a pure energy management driven project. There's no architectural furniture to, to make that denominator uh, work out. And so from a percentage standpoint, it looks horrible, but we're getting huge value out of it. And, yes, sir. Do you think there's a formal component of the requirements? Yeah. So yeah, the, the question is, do we use a formal uh, OPR or owner's project requirements? Um, I would call my quest for an OPR, my early quest for an OPR, an epic fail. Uh, it is, so we have a lot of people in our staff that were educated up at UW-Madison, University of Wisconsin-Madison. They have a fantastic program. Um, they, they preach the gospel of ASHRAE, Guideline Zero, or what is it, 202, 202 now? Yeah, there, there's like 15 now sections in ASHRAE that deal with commissioning. That, design charrette and the commissioning charrette to come up with the OPR, that's not gonna happen in our projects. Uh, we have a hard enough time getting the design team together with the right people to figure out what we want. So I, I do OPR by proxy. I attacked our standards. And now, uh, macro sense, our OPR is our standards book and the programming document for that project. That will get 80% of what we want. And literally, I am weekly drilling down into sections of our operation, or excuse me, our uh, design standards, and we're reworking them, we're rewording them, and, and getting to sitting around a table with all of our utilities guys and saying, you know, it says here that you can use, you know, PVC piping for the steam. Is that what you really mean? You know, and, and finding all those kind of ridiculous conflicts and making sure our standards are as tight as possible because we're not gonna go through that charrette. But what we can do is make sure that we have locked tight standards and we drop those on the desk of the design team and say, this is what you're designing to. So go ahead and get your basis of design document, but it's gonna be based on this. And so it becomes OPR by proxy. Syracuse University has a very good drop in this, a naming convention for all the buildings. What's the number of the rooms? What's the name of the area? I mean, it's everything. Yep. Yeah. Uh, Emory, uh, Emory University down in Atlanta has a great program. Uh, their guy down there, uh, Eric Gregory, he's, he's tuned in, switched on. The same thing. They have, they have done a very good job of documenting what they want. But it becomes, it literally becomes uh, OPR by proxy because that design, or that, that charrette that we're talking about doing, it just doesn't happen. You know, we have a hard enough time getting the right people in the room to make decisions about what color the carpet's gonna be, let alone making macro decisions on what type of systems we're gonna put in. Anybody else, yes? Does the university 
Yeah. Uh, boy, you're asking me to kind of pull my pants down a little bit because our, we don't do it well at the university. At first, for a lot of different reasons, our existing building commissioning group, which does all our retro and re, is under the energy management division. The capital side, which is my side, is under planning, design, and construction. Uh, our two sandboxes don't always butt up with each other. We're working on that. It's a, it's a siloing thing that is so frustrating. So what triggers it? Right now, energy. We, uh, University of Iowa has what we call our 2020 goals. We are putting approximately a million square feet of buildings online uh, in the, basically in the 2010s, and we are trying to keep our net gain at zero for energy usage. So we want to be using the same energy in 2020 as we were 2010. Uh, it's challenging. The best way to do that is to look at some of our energy hogs. Uh, we have a, a, a program going right now. We're piloting a different way of doing commissioning on a big energy hog, our Bowen Science Building. Science buildings suck. They suck steam, they suck electricity, and they suck chilled water. Um, and because of this Bowen Science Project, which is one of our, it's a 1960s technology, and some of the research going on in there is uh, security-wise is sensitive, and so some of these systems haven't been touched in 25 years, 30 years. Uh, they're, they're very tired. So what we did is we hired a commissioning firm to go in and effectively do uh, a retro commissioning, or in this case, uh, yeah, pr pretty much retro, before we even started to design on the project. On the, uh, and we're seeing a lot of synergy because they're sweeping through a room, they're making minor adjustments. Uh, when they leave the room, it's in better shape than when they walk in. The occupants see that. Better yet, they're finding minor repairs that can be done by our maintenance people who are literally sweeping in right behind them and making, making repairs. Uh, I can't remember the exact part, but one of the parts off of our uh, baby boxes that are in there, but you can't buy one because we started having enough problems with them. John's on the, John with Sebesta is on the team that's doing this project for us. We're, we bought all we can find. Um, good, good luck even on Craigslist finding any of these parts, because there are so many that we could fix and immediately making an improvement. And then any major issue that they find, they drop onto a sheet, the design team takes that real-time data, what's actually going on in the building, what's actually happening in the system, and they're designing the project, the, the replacement or refurbishing project based on that. So that's one of the things where we're starting to, trying, starting to bridge that gap between the kind of standalone retro and re projects and Capital, capital project. We don't do a good job of it, honestly. Um, I wish we did, Chad. I really, really wish we did. Any more questions? All right, I'll hit you with my, oh, yes, sir. When you uh, select your commissioning group, and I assume that they do a good job, do you keep a list and then do you rotate within that list to make others, I mean, to, because you say, you know, you can't use Um, that would be contrary to the uh, purchasing laws of the great state of Iowa, sir, so I'm either going to confirm nor deny that that happens. But buy me a cup of coffee later and I'll tell you that we do. <laughs> yeah, it's, it really is, a lot of it is, um, eventually we get down, we have a, a stable of great providers. We, we're serviced by some great companies. And within that stable, um, how do you select one versus the other? You know, which of my two children do I love the most? You know, depends on which one hasn't made me mad lately. You know, it, it's, it's, yeah, honestly, it's sort of that, that simple. Um, so in closing, I, I, have, I have an offer for everyone and I have uh, some food for thought. So the offer is this, me. Uh, I work for the people of the great state of Iowa and I have a lot of freedom to, to reach out. Part of our uh, institutional mission is outreach to industry. If you have an idea, uh, please call me. Send me an email. 
Um, I'm going to steal your ideas, just so you know. I want to be, <laughs> if it's a great idea, uh, I will ask your permission to make it part of our standard operating procedures. Uh, if, if you want insight into or even uh, contacts, there are a lot of, lot of institutions who are doing great work. Iowa State, or excuse me, not Iowa State, Michigan State. Iowa State, they got it all messed up up there. Uh, Michigan State, uh, Michigan, Emory is fantastic. Uh, a lot of, because of Title 24, uh, a lot of the California commissioning stuff, they're, they're, they're really cutting edge. Utah, we were talking about the state of Utah and they're building envelope requirements. Holy buckets. When I read their white paper, I'm like, you can't do that. I called the guy and I didn't call him a liar, but I asked him, you know, kind of where the numbers were fudged. They're doing it. Their buildings are tighter than, they're unimaginably tight. You know, why can't we do that? Why can't we do that everywhere? So have your owners call me. If they're wondering how, how we can set up their systems. Um, I love the idea of collaboration. That's why I do stuff, events like this. That's why I'm involved with AFA. That's why I'm involved with different organizations. Because we as a, as a consumer can help drive the industry where we want it to go. And, and the best way to do that is to exchange information. And having come from the private sector, uh, it's honestly, it's a little scary and refreshing how much information I'm allowed to share. So the first is the offer, and that's me. Please, please feel free to contact me. The second one is food for thought. And this is how do we, meaning as an industry, both consumers and providers, how do we start changing the face of this? How do we start educating the, the world as a whole as to the value and the value proposition of commissioning? You know, how do we shift from a construction activity to a whole building total cost of ownership mentality? One of the ways we do that, I think, is by stop, we're not contractors. Stop looking at yourself as a contractor. You're a consultant. Take the model of the MEPT consultants out there. You think they race to the bottom on price? Some of them do, and they don't do projects again at our house. No, don't, don't race to the bottom. Let's quit trying to be the lowest construction cost and start looking at ourselves, how do we become the highest value? Thank you all very much. I greatly appreciate it, and please stop by, and if you have questions, I, again, I'd love to collaborate with you. Thank you.